Welcome to Gorilla Discipleship. I'm Kevin Baker. I'm Tim Parker. We get to be your hosts again this week. We're back together, and uh, we're so glad that you're here. Thanks for joining us. And we're talking about behavior shifts. We've been um, focusing on what does it take for us to be transformed? What's the church's role, and, and how does that work? Uh, Tim, I'm going to tee it up this way, and then All have right. you respond to it. <laughs> Um, because we come out of a Wesleyan background, a mm-hmm. Methodist background, and uh, John Wesley was very methodical, as we all know, about how he did things. But something that we've recently discovered is that um, what John Wesley looked did in, his, in the way that he set up his societies and his uh, classes and his bands, the societies were the larger gatherings, and he did very practical teaching from the scriptures. He was trying to change people's thinking. Mm-hmm. Then he did small groups. We call He called them classes. Mm-hmm. And in those classes, it was all about accountability on behavior. Are you doing mm-hmm. uh, and, and where are you struggling? And then he had bands. Bands were, classes were mandatory. In fact, I think if I've got this right, you couldn't come to the society meeting unless you were in yeah. good standing in a band meeting. Right. So he started, the most important thing was accountability around how am I living my life. Then I would get my mind fed through practical biblical teaching. The band was voluntary for same gender, uh, two or three people, where I would uh, answer very detailed questions, questions like this, what sins have you committed this week? What temptations have you faced? So it was really meant to get deeper even than behavior or thinking. It was to get even to the place of what's going on in your heart? Mm-hmm. What are the motives or the intentions that you're struggling with that to keep you moving forward in a life of transformation. And Tim and I have been talking about this. Here at Oakdale, we're trying to get some of those shifts to take place. Would yeah. you say something about that? Yeah, I think the, the biggest area we're putting effort on right now in our message series, Behavior Shifts, is all about how do we get people in groups for the sake of behavior change yes. because we're still stuck in that knowledge-based yeah. um, desire and thirst and discipleship. And um, you really can't change your behavior unless you have accountability to change it. It's why I'm thinking I'm going to go off topic a little bit. Uh, I know people, maybe I'll, I'll just out my mom. My mom was in wow. Weight Watchers, right? And you don't do Weight Watchers unless you're in a group. Exactly. If you're trying to lose weight, you, I think they get on the scale and they count their points and they have their systems, but they get on the scale with a group of other people and they cheer each other on. And so there was no behavior change I, I, unless they're in Weight, weight watchers. watchers. You don't let anybody else see what you weigh, but you are going in yeah. in front of everybody yeah. and then you're you're talking about it. Yeah, exactly. Well, that's the behavior changes. There's accountability because exactly. other people are weighing too. We don't know yeah. the weight, but you still know that. Right, you know they're doing it. Yeah. And you made a point in one of your messages uh, two weeks ago, in your opening message two weeks ago about like joining the military. Yeah. The first thing that they do is not give you a bunch of information is they begin to shape you by behavior change mm-hmm. into the people that you need to be to become a soldier, a Marine, whatever it is. And the church has moved away from that in many yeah. ways. Wesley's, I think the key to Wesley's success in making disciples changed lives that were radically transformed and beginning to show off. And what people were seeing is, wow, you're a different person than you were before. And that was coming out of the strength of those class meetings where they they were expected every week to talk about, are you reading the scripture? How's your prayer life? Um, they were held accountable if they had moral failures, not in a, we're going to beat you up condemnation right. way, yeah. but in a, how can we encourage you? What can we do? And there is something about knowing every week, if I'm going to be asked by people <laughs> that I'm going to be sitting with, hey, what sins have you committed that you go, mm, maybe I won't commit any sins this week because, or at least I'm going to resist it more because I don't want to have to say in front of my friends. And so one of the things that I think we're... Positive peer influence. Positive peer influence. <laughs> yeah. I think you mentioned that. Yeah. <laughs> and and I, I want to say, for those of you who are a part of Oakdale, I think you're noticing a change and a shift in what we're doing. You may have noticed that our preaching has changed because... Mm-hmm. We're trying to do practical equipping. We're we're not emphasizing increasing your knowledge as much as we're trying to increase your understanding of how to be equipped. And now we're really rallying you together. We want to rally you together into small groups, mm-hmm. into uh, communities. And what I called this, this last Sunday, I called them uh, in, um, equipping, communities. equipping communities. Thank yeah. you. That we want... To, for you to be in a community, not that just feeds your needs for feeling like you've got friends, mm-hmm. but 
groups of people, a group of people who are equipping you to walk forward in the faith, who are helping you, modeling for each other and encouraging one another toward behavior change. Um, maybe we could just talk a little bit about that. Tim, you've yeah. been involved in those kinds of groups. Yeah. How does that work when you know, let's let's say that you and I are in a group together, mm -hmm. and uh, and I say to you three weeks in a row, um, my prayer life stinks, <laughs> yeah. and, and I, I just haven't been able to really get any time of prayer. What's the response in a com an, an equipping community that would happen? Yeah, I think after having relational equity and a bond and things like that, we say, "Man, Kevin, you you said that three weeks in a row is you know what's up? What's going on? Is there a deeper issue, or how can we help you, or do you want me to text you? Like th this seems like it's a recurring issue. Yeah, what can we do to help you, or what can we do about it together? So good. And, yeah, and you know, again, the point that Tim makes is we've got some connection, right? He's not mm -hmm. just walking up to me asking me if my prayer life is okay and then slamming me if it isn't. In fact, nothing that you said, Tim, yeah. was really derogatory or condemning. It's like w w just asking me, yeah. hey, what can we do? What do you need? Do you know what's going on? And that's so important for us to have a community of people who are asking us, in a sense, the tough questions. Yeah. How is your prayer life? Or or what is going on? I, I know I'm in a, a band meeting, mm -hmm. so it's a little deeper. Uh, but there's one of the guys and uh, other pastors in this band meeting, and one of the pastors, his his statement every single week we get together is he's too busy, and so you you do begin to say, well, what are you going to do about that? And yeah. I think what has what he has come to is saying, I don't know what to do about mm. that. If I could, he, he, I think he feels powerless about trying to do a better job of getting his schedule shifted or his his busyness shifted, and he knows it's a problem. Um, he knows every week he's going to share that it's mm -hmm. a problem, and if it hasn't been, um, often he will say things like this, I I've been too busy to even be tempted to do things, but I know my busyness is really a problem as well. So I hope you're hearing this is a loving environment. This yeah. is not a, this is a group of friends spurring one another on. It's, it's like... Um, I know you're a power lifter. I've never done power <laughs> lifting, but I've been on baseball teams yeah, and basketball yeah, teams yeah. where, you know, the whole point is to say, we we want you to play to your best potential. Mm -hmm. How can we, I'll, hey, I'll come shoot baskets with you. You know, if that will help, if what you want is to run some plays, I'll come. It'll help me yeah. it'll, and I want to help you. It's on a wrestling team, someone's trying to cut weight and you need the whole wrestling team. You go and run with them to help them cut the weight or yeah, yeah. stay there after practice to get extra drills in. Yeah. There you go. And so that's what this is. I mean, wouldn't that be... Now, what's the fear? The fear is that you're going to have to expose where you're not doing well. Mm -hmm. um, or it will become apparent even without you trying to expose it because it's yeah. of your presence or lack of right. conversation. Exactly. Or, yeah. Um, and, and here's the thing. I think that's why God's word says, confess your sins so that you may be healed. Mm -hmm. The idea is whatever I have in the dark has power over yep. me. But if I will bring it out into the light with trusted people who are not out to condemn me, but actually there to encourage me. And that's what the church is supposed to be, right? Is uh, brothers and sisters mm -hmm. encouraging one another. That I'm actually getting my burdens. I'm, I'm taking care of this secret, this, this thing that I'm dealing with all by myself, maybe just in prayer. I'm now saying, would you carry some of the load? And that's what I think Paul says in Galatians, right? Yeah. That we are to bear one another's burdens. Yeah. Um, and, and, I've got to carry my own backpack of the things that in life that are mine, but I do need at times help carrying the things that have become burdensome that I can't figure out what to do. Mm -hmm. And that changes in the seasons of life, yeah. and it changes person to person. Tim may not have any of the burdens that I have, uh, and I may not have mm -hmm. any of the burdens that Tim has, but we can relate to each other's burdens and, yeah. and support and encourage each other. Yeah, I was just going to add, um, I just keep, can't shake this thought from my mind Go. that when you're in a group, it's not just the rest of the group um, coming to like positively influence you. There's also that like internal um, desire. And I can't get shake the phrase. I think I am keep saying in my mind over and over again that when you belong to a group, you want to behave like the group. You want to mm. act like them. And so there's that like, well, everyone else in the group is, and I'm in a parenting group, reading to their kids a yeah. Bible every night or praying with their kids at dinner time. I really feel like compelled. Maybe I should start trying that too. Cause I want to behave like them. Cause I want to be like them. And th not that they're forcing me to 
do all the things and negative influence and um, this kind of like I feel left out, but it's that there's that in, there's not just the external, there's the internal pressure. I think that's you know, that's good. That brings up a good point. What if you've got a group of folks who uh, have set the bar really low? Yeah. <laughs> then no one's urging anyone on to anything, right? Yeah. And so as you think about getting in a group, um, maybe you can be aware of that. And maybe you'll be the one that's spurring each other, spurring the rest of them on, yeah. calling them forth. doesn't mean that you're perfect or better than anybody else. It just means your passion is, I want to do better. And I'm going to keep bringing up, what could we do to, to walk better, walk closer, uh, abide uh, more in Christ? Uh, because I think we all do need those those spurring agents within mm-hmm. the group that can do it graciously, not not whole, not uh, heavy handedly. Um, but you're, you, what Tim is saying, if we have a group where there are no expectations, or you get to do and say whatever you want, so there almost needs to be a, I don't know if you would say Tim a, a formal covenant, but a. A sort of an agreement that we're here to win. Yeah, you know, to win the race of of walking in a in a way that will bring transformation into yeah. our there lives. There needs to be some sort of implicit covenant contract agreement yeah. that we're actually trying to improve one another and we're trying to work towards something. So in our yeah. parenting group, it's like we're trying to work towards being uh, better kingdom parents. That's awesome. And that's kind of what we said, and that's what we came around in raising missional families. And so we kind of hold each other accountable to those things. So getting a group is hard. Yeah. Um, once you find the uh, the group that you can do life with, uh, it's hard to let go of them. Uh, I've been in those groups, and some of them have are still, you know, they're 20, 30 years down the mm-hmm. road. I still have contact with those folks. Um, but it can be intimidating, and, and so we're going to help in whatever way we can here at Oakdale for those of you. But, but let's just talk about, and, and Tim, I'm throwing this right at you. Let's just Uh-oh. talk about some ways that... Um, that how can you what what would be four or five Ooh. things that you that we would that you would recommend for people who are saying I do want to be a part of a of a group like that I want to be a part of a, an equipping community um, and I'll start us yeah go for it and then that way I'm giving you a little <laughs> bit of, first thing I would do is to pray mm-hmm. just to say God you know what I want here and so I'm inviting you to help my heart and to help me find, help me to listen. You direct me, provide the right people. Pray um, about what you want, because this is something you want God directing and you want to be walking in obedience to God. So, um, Tim, any other yeah. thoughts? Yeah, if you're not at Oakdale, which we're going to assume you're not, because there's a whole bunch of pathways, yeah. uh, I would say you got to identify other people who you might have an affinity with, because affinity is probably the strongest connection. If you Just someone that you generally... Um, like or look up to or you think they're doing a good job with their kids or you just have a lot of things in common or whatever that affinity is with parenting football you're both men same age i don't know whatever it is look for that i I think the next step would be identify someone um after the prayer i love that and so and let me just say about this they don't have to be church people right they have to be people who are interested in growing spiritually uh interested in discovering who god is uh as the bible has revealed him and and are looking to uh, see the power of God uh, revealed and and w- at work in their lives. So this could be coworkers. It's not only the affinity; it needs to be people who, in addition to people that you would feel comfortable with, maybe you're even like to get to know better. Yeah. Um, but it's people that you have access to in a fairly easy way. If you can't get together, um, now you could invite with technology. You could be doing this uh, over Zoom with people who live mm-hmm. anywhere. Which is a good thing, right? Yeah. We have nothing. a guy at Oakdale who's doing it with his friends since childhood all across the U.S. via Zoom. There you but go. they have that affinity of the childhood. There you go. Yeah. So don't think just who can I sit in a room with. Uh, your your e- equipping community might be a virtual uh, connection more than a in-person connection. And maybe two th- times a year you get together in person just to celebrate. Mm-hmm. Um, but so it's 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 you're, you're going to pray. You're going to think about who do I have an affinity uh, with that that I feel would feel comfortable with this. Think about who do I have proximity to, either mm-hmm. through technology or through, um, you know, they they we work together. We could do this at lunch at work, or these are folks in my neighborhood. We can easily gather together. Anything else? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to go even more down the road. Yep. I got to ask. <laughs> yes, <laughs> uh, that's maybe the hardest and scariest places for most of us. Yep. But I think we. The, uh, are more afraid of the ask than... We're afraid of rejection. We're afraid of rejection. Yeah. 
but I don't think it has to be a hard, hey, let's meet every week for four hours studying the book of Leviticus in its original language. <laughs> I don't think that's not going to go over very well. Uh, just, hey, I've been thinking and praying, and I noticed that you're someone who seems to want to grow in your faith or has a spiritual component. I think, you know... Um, I like if we could get together and, you know, just do life together based on, you know, some principles and say, yeah. that's, can we, can we talk about it over coffee sometime? That's and a then, great thing. Yeah. I, I, what I love about that, and you do have to, somebody has to start, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, and so if this is where God's got on your heart, then you be the person who asks and don't worry about rejection as we've just been talking about. We live in a busy culture and people might want it, or maybe they're going to be afraid of it, but it's not going to hurt you to ask them, and it's going to bless them that they got asked. And I would say, as Tim just said, I want to just amplify it. The ask is, hey, I'm interested in growing spiritually, mm -hmm. and I, I really believe that I need to do that with other people. Are you interested in, in that as well? Let the logistic, if they say yes, yes, they might ask you, what are you thinking? Say, I don't know exactly. I'm open to how we do it. Yeah, Let the logistics, let's have coffee and talk about that. Exactly. I want you to be an equal part in this. Yes. Yeah. The logistics can be worked out mm -hmm. collaboratively, uh, hopefully, and you can come to some agreement about time. And, you know, you don't have to go with the, I've got it already. It's got to be Thursday this time, you know, whatever. But if they're interested at all, it will be a great conversation. Even if you end up deciding you can't get together in this moment, you've started a spiritual conversation that may mm -hmm. end up leading to some great things. So here's what we've got. Pray. Who think, begin to think about who is in your sort of circle of, of affinity, who you care about, uh, who you have proximity to or access to, uh, either virtually or, or um, in person. And then you've got to ask. Mm -hmm. You've got to be the person that starts. Tim said the other week, and I just want to remind you of this, um, a small group probably is ideal. I think you said something between 5 and 12. Yeah, that's kind remember. of what we've, we've seen, yeah. Um, and so... I, I think that um, three and under is probably too small. Mm -hmm. uh, if you want a, a band meeting where you can really be intimate, um, then then by all means, get two or three people together. Yeah. If you're going to do that, keep it same gender. You don't want to talk that intimately with cross-gender people. It, it leads to the potential of intimacy in inappropriate ways. But if you're going to have a small group, it could be mixed gender because the intimacy will be uh, appropriate for a group that's that's of that nature. Um, but ask a few people. Once you ask the first person and they say yes, then say, who else would you like to be in? So they there may be people in your small group that they're going to invite, people in the small group that you're going to invite, and you'll begin to know each other through that. But you, you are going to see your kingdom uh, and your relationship base expand, and that's going to be a positive thing. Anything else? Yeah, I would say do it for a definite period of time. Yeah. Not indefinite. So say yeah. like, all right, now that we've found people and we've identified them and you've made the ask and you have four or five people and they say, hey, we're going to do Thursdays at seven every other week. You say, okay, how about we're just going to try it for four weeks. Yeah. And after four weeks, we'll identify it. It's not going to, but actually do it and actually make it definitive. Yeah. Because if you don't, if you don't actually start like a, like a begin date and an end date, you won't do it. Yeah. Or people will be afraid of, uh, committing to something that they can't do for the rest of their life. Exactly. So I would say just just yeah. start it and... Yeah, yeah. and I would say make the commitment. For, anything less than four weeks is too small. Yeah. Um, but, you know, I wouldn't go anything farther than six months to begin. So yeah. somewhere between one month and six months. Yeah. Hey, could we get together for the next three weeks or, or excuse me, three months? Um, that gives people a, okay, I can do anything for three months, even if I hate it. Uh, <laughs> but, but the reality is... It gives you time to say, hey, this is really working. Uh, two weeks is not enough time. No. You could have two sort of off weeks where you feel like, ah, oh, I'm not getting anything out of this. So don't go anything less than four weeks. And the whole group might not show up for the first two weeks. That's exactly right. Um, <laughs> and be patient with that. People, it's hard to change our rhythms and get new rhythms mm -hmm. in. So be patient uh, with each other. Like, hey, I'm going to do. But I think part of the ask would be, can you make this a priority? Mm -hmm. Can you prioritize this so that, you know, hopefully eight to nine out of 10, you'll be there. Uh, we understand everybody's got exceptions to that. But if nobody makes it a priority, then yeah. it, it really, you've already sealed its fate. It in our group, work. we say if three of the five families can't make it, then we're not going to meet because there's no point in, in less than half of us not being exactly. there. Exactly. And, yeah. and you don't want to 
have half the group moving forward in some Correct. serious intimacy. On the other hand, I, over the years, I've been involved in larger groups, like maybe a, a men's Bible study where there was, you know, maybe even 15 guys, 12 guys. And there were some times when, as we got meeting, I can remember, I can remember one particular time that it was a, a, we met on Monday nights and it was a holiday. And so most of the guys were like, hey, I can't make it, mm -hmm. I can't make it. One of the guys who was really spiritually hungry uh, just called me and said, look, I don't know about you, but I want to make it no matter what. Yeah. And so I said, well, if you're willing to be there, I'll be there. And uh, actually four guys showed up that night. Probably yeah. normally was 12. We had four guys. And that was the night this guy gave his life to Jesus. It was it was one of the most powerful evenings. And so don't get discouraged that um, maybe on the evenings that there are fewer people, God may do something even more powerful. Um, but again, five to, to 12 people is a good size small group. And that would be individuals, not five couples or, or 12 couples. That's too many people. <laughs> Ouch. <laughs> uh, but, you know, um, six couples, that's that, you know, you're at your maximum. Four couples is a good number. That's eight people. That's, yeah. a, that's a great thing. Uh, can be couples and singles. These groups could be multi generational as mm -hmm. well. There's nothing wrong with having an age group. Now, we tend to think. Um, like, well, I want to get people that are close to my age or close to my circumstance, and there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, it may be that in your situation, a multi-generational group is going to actually be a fantastic yeah. thing. So be open to yeah. God leading you to have, you know, someone who's in their grandparenting season and someone who's not even married yet. God could do amazing things uh, with that as well. Oh, definitely. I think that's one of the, the, the pieces that we don't have the most, I think multi-generational groups yeah. actually have the most potential for power, but yet most of us want to be around people who look like us, but right. the best um, mentorship and apprenticeship happens with the different ages. Yeah. 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 So, and uh, I, I, you know, here's the thing that I think we would encourage you to do. Start. Yeah. Start praying. Just make a commitment. Uh, don't let fear freeze you from what God has for you. Don't let the fear of, man, I don't know if this is going to work. Uh, of course you don't know if it's going to work. Uh, you know, fear of, of whatever kind, that's the enemy whispering in your head uh, to keep you from the very thing that God really built us for, which is connections and relationships and community. Mm -hmm. So, hey, we're uh, just so glad that you're plugging in with Guerrilla Discipleship. We're going to talk uh, again for the next few weeks about behavior shifts. Uh, Tim, you got anything else for today? No, I think it's good to wrap it up. It was uh, wonderful to be with you. As always, my email is kbaker at oakdale.church. I'm T. Parker at oakdale.church. And I think you can make some comments right here. Uh, share this with any friends that you think it would be helpful to. God bless you. Thanks for being with us again this week. We'll see you next week.